Famed tech entrepreneur Steve Jobs once spoke of the second product syndrome. When a company or a group of people make their first project and it turns out to be a success, they're almost never able to replicate it the second time around. While not the first of its kin, the Powerpuff Girls had cemented Cartoon Network's status as a longtime player in the field of TV animation by giving them a brand new and lucrative flagship franchise. But near the end of its seven year run, its creative staff got to work on their next animated series, and really, whether or not it succumbed to second product syndrome is entirely up to interpretation. Foster's home for imaginary friends is zany, colourful, and unforgettable cartoon magic, and I can't stand it! And I guess it comes from an aversion I had in my childhood to most Flash cartoons. As a Disney Channel kid growing up with the Australasian feed, we'd sometimes get cheap, forgettable imports from Australia and the UK, while Disney's actual animated shows were on the off-season. So seeing one of Cartoon Network's biggest shows at the time looking and feeling no different from the disposable stuff on Disney Channel, and that's saying something in a different context, really turned me away. I had no idea why it was such a fixture of the network for five years, or how the people behind the Powerpuff Girls made it, or even why people would like the characters and jokes. Now that I'm grown up and can see greater flaws in the writing, general storytelling and characterization, I personally don't even have a warm nostalgia for this show that can soften the worst of it. That isn't to say you shouldn't like Fosters anymore if you loved it as a kid and still get a kick out of it now. The point of this review isn't to shut you down or make you feel ashamed of what you like, not at all. This is coming from someone who never got the appeal of this show, and while there are some good things I can say about it, I can tell most of these complaints will come off as rash or pedantic to its fans. I still believe there was a lot of time and care put into the making of this show to make it as entertaining as it could possibly be, and I should also make it clear that I don't harbour any resentment towards the staff of this show for making something I don't enjoy that much. There's a bad egg here or there, but I mean for their work on a cartoon, not for who they are as people. But who was the ringleader in this circus of imaginary beings? None other than Craig McCracken. I'm not giving him a silly nickname this time, I'll be giving his creation enough of a workout. On Christmas 2002, the first after the release of the Powerpuff Girls movie, he and his wife and fellow animator Lauren Faust got puppies to celebrate the holiday. With joy in the year and less time being spent running the Powerpuff Girls as season 5 entered production, this gave Craig the idea to make a story about dogs and what their lives would have been like before being adopted. Think pound puppies, but actually fun. But he soon began adding more original ideas and his imagination kind of ran away with him. 18 months of development, or really a year before production on the pilot commenced, and this, I think, was already to the show's detriment. Typically, pre-production on an animated show lasts at least two or even three or four years to ensure that all the writers and voice actors are on the same page, the art style and animation are as good as they can be, and most importantly, so that the chief creative staff and the network executives are absolutely sure on how to manage the show. This wasn't all feasible, and Craig and Lauren's prior success with the Powerpuff Girls and their decision to animate the show on Adobe Flash, which would provide much faster results for less money, meant that Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends would be approved, pick up, and become a success no matter what. It premiered with the TV movie, House of Blues, on August 13th, 2004, becoming the first Cartoon Network original to premiere after the city rebrand in the US, as well as one of the first to not be branded a cartoon cartoon, except for in Japan. But it's still remembered as the end of an era for the network. This was their last series for a while to be primarily developed and worked on by some of the original hand-picked animators from the What A Cartoon Show days as Cartoon Network had started to seek out fresher blood and take a more streamlined approach to greenlighting new programming. Ratings and critical reception were pretty darn positive while it was running, going for six seasons and ending on May 3rd, 2009, but now that the hype surrounding it has long died down, it's a common sentiment that Foster's is the weakest of Craig's four shows, if not the only flat out bad one. Nostalgia is a powerful thing, hindsight even more so. There are plenty of people out there who still enjoy it and have every right to, but it really hasn't held up to scrutiny to others. What happened? And what's changed about the TV industry since the mid to late 2000s for so many people to have these divided feelings? Featuring such blues classics as Feelin' Blue, Getting Rid of the Blues, 
blues, and no one wants the blues. <laughs> Mac is an eight-year-old boy living in a dingy apartment with his distant mother, cruel older brother Terence, and an imaginary friend, Blue, who's always been there to confront Terence with mind games and sass, but has started to develop some violent tendencies. Mac's mother convinces him it's time to get rid of Blue, but the two come to a solution. They find out about a foster home for imaginary friends, happily named, but Mac has to visit Blue every day by four o'clock once he's initiated, while having to keep it a secret from his family, and going about his day-to-day -day life, and putting up with all the other imaginary friends up for adoption and a bit of fun. Sounds sweet and wholesome, right? Think again. This is a decent, if not great, setup for an animated series. A whole building full of imaginary friends kids have thought up over time, and full of a near endless array of rooms to play and hang around in? Sounds like paradise. Well, that paradise comes at a cost. Blue turns out to be a massive troublemaker, and if it isn't him causing mischief, it's the manager Mr. Harriman's long set of frivolous rules driving everyone nuts, or any other kind of peace-breaking chaos. So you've got this heavy introduction to the show about two kids pledging to keep in touch with each other in a newer, distant environment, where the stories often turn into cartoon insanity. Sure, no problem, I'm with you so far. But what is this cast like? Well, Mac is sort of the every kid. He likes to do whatever the plot demands and behaves however the plot demands. Sometimes he's shy and reserved, other times he's a fun-loving prankster. He's certainly not the blankest of slates, he has some consistent personality traits, but never enough to where I felt I could rely on him to carry a story on his own. His imaginary friend and bisexual icon, Blue Regard Q Kazoo, is a handful. I believe smashing a vase over a kid's head in your first three minutes of screen time is something you can never recover from when the show has to frame you sympathetically. He's generally ill-behaved, greedy, hypocritical, aggressive, even rather unfriendly, basically almost entirely negative personality traits. As long as you count being funny as a positive trait, and give him all the flack you want, his dry wit can sometimes strike. He's not at the top of my list, but he's hardly what you'd call a hero, a villain, or even an anti-hero. Just a little smurf wart that manufactures problems. Frankie Foster is the home's caretaker and easily the character many people like the most, myself included. She's a feisty, hard-working young adult who can just about stand her boss, but still has the time and energy to love the imaginary friends she takes care of every day. Good role model, and a good character to throw into this sort of world. Her grandmother, Madame Foster, is your typical dotty old lady with a hidden wild side. She's pretty tropey, but it's not like she harms the show by being there. Mr. Harriman is her old imaginary friend, a British bunny who's obsessed with keeping a tight ship running, much to the detriment of others' enjoyment and the pace of any given story. I get his gruff personality and bossy mannerisms, but he's hardly ever able to be more than a killjoy. Onto Blue's roommates, some of the only other entertaining residents. Wilt is a tall, slightly battered friend created to play basketball and be of assistance, and assistance he provides. He's probably the most sentimental character on the show, being a comfort food character more often than not. Too bad he doesn't really fit the tone after a while. Eduardo is a big, soft Mexican minotaur created to defend a girl from bullies. Again, nice character with slightly more suitable stories, but his voice is a bit grating to me, and he wasn't always as brave as he should have been, given that's the reason he exists. Coco is a surreal Pacific bird creature that only says her name and can lay eggs with surprises in them. A very bizarre idea for a character in every sense, but I have to be honest, although she's a non-verbal comic relief, she's still one of the more fun ones to watch. The rest of the cast really, really isn't my cup of tea. You've got Terence, Max Hooligan older brother, who's more or less the reason why he spends as much time away from home as possible. He's got that use going for him, but is otherwise an unpleasant stock bully character who hardly even has good jokes. Probably my least favourite character on the show, and I'm really happy they downplayed his importance so quickly. Duchess is a living, ugly painting that you can't get rid of. Having one of the casual residents at Foster's be the stuck-up old killjoy has its uses, but they can only do so much with her cycle of torment, almost getting adopted, then not. A couple new characters get introduced over the course of the show. Cheese, thought up by Louise, is a toddler-like imaginary friend who behaves like a handicapped child, 
launching himself into dangerous situations when left alone and spouting non sequiturs all the time. I believe there's a nugget of a good idea in him, that many children and even adults need extra help and support because they're unable to navigate the world on their own, and this sort of message is excellent to convey in a fantasy context, they just forgot to give him a real use other than to be yet another automatic troublemaker, with the occasionally funny non sequitur not making him any more useful of an addition beyond his debut. Then you have Goo, a hyperactive girl with an uncontrollable imagination. Sounds like a great addition, right? Wrong! Her debut is one of the most irritating, nonsensical, contrived and manipulative episodes I've ever seen, and it's unable to convince you of the potential she could have had as a friend to Mac. Many of the other imaginary friends that inhabit Foster's are pretty one note, but are at least nice to look at. Just don't ask me what the practical use for some of them is. The cast is pretty split down the middle, not in quality, but in attitude. Some of them are nice, dependable peeps, but most of them tend to exist solely to stir up conflict. But Blue, since you've been here, you've broken the statue of Madame Foster, opened a secret door wreaking havoc on everyone, uploaded a video to make an international fool of Mr. Harriman, flooded the house, threw a party against house rules, sabotaged a date Frankie had, destroyed a beloved toy elephant, completely ruined my reputation at school, blew the roof off the house. Your point? One of my biggest pet peeves with Foster's home is how plot-driven the characters' behaviours are. You don't often get character-driven stories, where they go through arcs and learn a lesson. Sounds like a meaningless complaint, but it often means things happen just because they have to happen, and characters will often be left clueless, rash or unreasonably out of character so that things can get wackier. It's fine if this happens on a less regular basis, if they have some really good stories and jokes to tell where the characters need to be a little looser, but since it happens all the time, almost none of the characters get the chance to change or develop or even behave the same way from week to week. Idiot plots reign supreme, and misunderstandings? Only the wackiest! And this wouldn't be so bad if the show didn't have such a tight continuity. Older episodes are referenced in later ones or even given sequels. The plan was originally that characters such as Blue would start out very flawed, but go through character development as the seasons progressed. But Cartoon Network executives nixed this idea, arguing that the show had to be somewhat episodic so it could be watched at any order in reruns. Didn't stop shows like Codename Kids Next Door from developing its characters over time. I can't blame anyone but the executives for this flaw, but also believe that Craig and or Lauren should have negotiated with them for a longer period so it could actually be the show they and their crew wanted, rather than getting to work on it almost immediately with all these problems looming over them. That being said, how they allowed the show to evolve in spite of this restriction wasn't what I'd call ideal, personally. I think it's about time I say something nice about this show, so I'll disagree with younger me about the animation being a turn-off. Sure, Flash animation became inescapable as the 2000s went on and wasn't used to its full capabilities, but Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends was a show that needed that extra automation and fluidity. Remember, it began in 2004, and looks better than most of its kin from around 2008. If I had to take a guess, this was because it was made by good animators, with a vision and urge to do something different after so many years of the same kind of art style. Mike Moon was the lead art director for the early seasons, who also occupied that position on Mickey Mouse Works and House of Mouse. I've already sung my praises on those shows, so he was the right man for the job qualified enough to even be credited as a co-developer, they were able to make a strange but vibrant world, slightly psychedelic even. Every room in Foster's is a different colour, but you never notice due to how rich the design work is. There's the occasional ugly character model, and a few of the designs feel more suited to hand-drawn animation methods, but this is rather impressive for its time. I hope this doesn't sound too condescending, but Foster's Home is to Flash animation what Jimmy Neutron is to CGI, a learning curve that's rather primitive by our current understanding of the medium, but still somewhat creative and easy to look at. The first season of Foster's Home is the one least marred by the rubbish that slowly enveloped the show. The stories are a bit on the safe and slow side, which is a blessing in disguise given how you'll need to understand what these characters tend to be like with simpler adventures. 
You'll know by the end that there's a 1 in 12 chance of Wilt ending the episode by locking children in a wardrobe. The season was probably the nicest depiction of Mac and Blue's friendship. They actually get along this season. Earlier episodes tend to portray Blue as a well-meaning but completely naive or desperate kid. But by the end, someone felt he needed to be louder, angrier, and have access to a time machine. There was an honest-to-god attempt to make him likeable near the start. Look at the difference between the first promo, where he's cheerfully guiding the viewer through the concept of the show, to one leading up to the premiere movie, which highlights all his most unflattering out-of-context scenes. Not the clips I would have picked! I don't know if it was Craig or Lauren or Cartoon Network or even his voice actor Keith Ferguson who's to blame, but it really is a warning sign of things to come. I wouldn't call it a very funny season, even the best episodes are just the best told or have the most interesting ideas. But there's something to be said about posting a video to the internet being the most original story in season 1. Parts of it age well today, which I can't say about their next internet focused episode. Overall, season 1 has a couple messy episodes, but isn't a bad start. Forgivable of any season 1 really. They just need to look at what worked the most and expand upon that. Boy, they really seem to like the ending to Adopt Calypse now. Season 2 is where they started to incorporate more jerkish trends into some of the cast, mostly the one-offs to be fair, and subsequently ended many of their stories on downer notes. Sometimes they can be so unexpectedly weird that they're worth a laugh, but they end up leaving a bitter taste in your mouth more often than not. It's full of shaggy dog stories, where nothing positive is gained, achieved, or learned. And you can start to see characters like Blue and Frankie behave the way they do, simply so the ending can be postponed or altered to be less satisfying. Squeakerbox is a particularly awful example of this trend. They were fighting hard to keep him from being sympathetic there. Once they introduce Cheese, this shift in direction becomes way more apparent. Cheese is an imaginary friend that can't help himself from being bothersome. Mac Daddy is so loved and quoted in part due to his particular mannerisms. But then they started making all the other characters just as silly and unpredictable. Characters that had been established for a season and a half and who people had come to relate to. That could now change in the blink of an eye if a dumb joke needed to be made. I don't know if this is also something Cartoon Network forced them to do, but it was still not the right direction to take things if they wanted to maintain a soft, welcoming image. There are some great episodes in here that indeed capitalize on the template season 1 laid out, but they're drowned out by many prone to some lamentable trends. So after 11 quick months, Foster's Home was already in its third season, and its longest by far. I usually look forward to season 3's because they're when the show's out of its growing pains, but still full of energy and ideas. Well, season 3 of Foster's Home had plenty of ideas, and they led to it being my least favourite. I struggle hard to find episodes in here that I'm comfortable saying are a good time. So many of them have only one goal beat down on a character until it's no longer remotely funny, then paint them as the bad guy for not putting up with the madness. Indoor voices are also a thing of the past, many of the characters' performances aren't as listenable as they were in the first two seasons. And don't forget to crank up the volume on the background music, if they like the ragtime then they'll love it when they're paired up with Descents into Insanity! Note that Mike Moon only worked on a few season 3 episodes before leaving, so a lot of that warmth he put in that helped grab you win with is fading rapidly. I can't say the animation's getting worse, or much better really. Not that that's what I'm really concerned with at this point, I just hated watching this show. It's developed an assaultive sense of humour and a terribly repetitive formula that should have been sorted out by now, not accelerated. You can have this sort of acerbic tone in cartoons designed for older kids or adults, as long as it has a point of course. The Powerpuff Girls went for a slightly older audience, but knew when too far was too far, even after the good seasons. It's just bizarre that a show this inherently appealing and charming went off the rails so quickly, seemingly by accident. Oh, picker. I'm a toe pick. I'm a hot toe picker. Pick my toe, it's hot! Pick my hot toe picket! I guess the nicest thing I can say about season 4 is that it's more creatively annoying than 3. They have no shortage of ways to leave you frustrated and disappointed this go around. A pointless treasure hunt, an unwanted slumber party, 
Blue getting excited over an LCD game? Come on, it's 2006! The DS is out, get with the times! I guess that is one thing I liked about watching this show in order. Technology and fashion slowly changing from the start of the show to the end, much like with the Powerpuff Girls. Jeez, who remembers emo culture and camo fashion? There were more gambles taken here with the stories chosen, and some of them are pretty ambitious. And that could just be because this show about imaginary friends loves to act like a bad sitcom, so anything a little more adventurous or threatening is interesting. Not always successful, this is still a pretty bad season overall, but I'm willing to call it a little better than 3. With any given episode from that season, you go in knowing exactly what you won't like about it, and have to wade through it. 4 will always try to find the next exciting way to tick you off. At least it has the TV movie, Good Will Hunting, which if not a pretty good movie, gives some much needed lore on plenty of the imaginary friends, and points out that children all think them up for a very personal and useful reason. So now you sort of expect this to be a consideration when they introduce new friends, it's not much to ask. Who couldn't live without a microscopic pea man with the voice of Mickey Mouse? Curse you, Fosters, and your unfathomable dinormosity! Preach into the choir, man. Season 5 made the right call and strove to head out into the world as much as possible. More new locations, new human people, new countries, good lord, anything so we don't have to repeat the big cheese. Why must you taunt me? Okay, to be fair, this is another slight improvement over the prior season. Their willingness to tell more original stories is paying off. Really hope they could have done that for 2 and 3 rather than 4 and 5, but better late than never, I guess. Season 5's favourite trick is to have a generally standard kids show episode with a happy ending, then subvert it with some dub twist that almost makes you regret being invested. They start calling it a wah wah moment. Fellas, I think they're starting to become self-aware. They're even digging up background characters for stories and jokes now, let's see where that takes them. Now season 5 was the first to be animated in widescreen and high definition, and I believe this is an obvious improvement, it's more colourful and expressive than ever before. The only thing they changed about the intro is some slightly smoother movement, and Blue having a more sinister grin before pouncing on Mac at the end. Isn't that adorable? But at a time when more Flash animated shows were coming out, to the point some people were worried it would replace hand-drawn animation, it's nice to see that it was more than an asset in Foster's case. Oh heavens, what's happening? You picked them up, that's what's happening! Well this was a relapse. They'd slowly been easing up on the patented Foster's home cynicism, but we're back to more samey and contrived stories. On top of a heaping amount of not-so-sad farewells. Plenty of episodes here were about the characters almost leaving Foster's, but not really. They were really scrambling to leave you with a positive memory of these characters, and the one they found the biggest victory with was the one you'd least expect. These last two seasons aren't what I'd call a return to form, I mean there's not much of a form to return to, but I can sense that they were scrambling now to keep the show fresh. Maybe they shouldn't have just repeated all the story ideas and make one of the most damaging series finales ever. Very little of what I hate about the show was fixed, but I guess they ended it the way they wanted to. Some of the experimentation from 4 is back, namely a special episode where viewers could vote on the Cartoon Network website to see who could win a race from the game hive to Foster's, Mac or Blue. You see the catch is whoever you vote for collapses and gets trolled in a hospital bed in their ending, so shame on you for wanting to see them achieve something. At the very least, Destination Imagination is another good TV movie. It almost makes me wish the series consisted of annual TV movies rather than full seasons. I say almost because for all my complaining, there are a couple good episodes if you dig for them. So to leave on a positive note, I'll go through the worst first. Yep, I'm gonna be relentless. Crime After Crime is the sort of episode that shatters to pieces as soon as you ask yourself who you're meant to be rooting for. Harriman, who's abusing his power just so he can eat more carrots. Frankie and Madden, who can't look up and see their it dish being contaminated with ceiling dust. Blue, who's just compelled to create anarchy. It's three idiot plots for the price of one. Seeing Red as the one where Terence creates a big, dumb imaginary friend who just exists to be big and dumb. Don't worry, there are more jokes than that. Two of the worst in season one, actually. Sight for Sore Eyes should have been a sweet and maybe serious story about a blind kid who thought up a friend with tons of eyes, but it's the exact opposite, a frenetic, unfocused mess with a tacked-on heart. 
Kevin McDonald's guest role as Ivan was the only remarkable thing about it otherwise. Pranks for Nothing takes the madness of Fosters to a hotel. Fun shenanigans should ensue, right? Well, how about a one-sided prank war and two of the biggest wastes of space you could think up? These Fred twins are these weird spaced out fuzzballs that add zilch other than to make the episode even more poorly paced. Imposter's Home for um, Make'em Up Pals has a twist that you can see coming from 50 miles away. The smug kid who's mooching off the home and treating Frankie like garbage is actually an imaginary friend. That's the only conclusion you can come to from the very beginning, and it doesn't excuse the way everyone treats her or make the story any funnier. Squeeze the day, oof, now we're getting to the truly terrible. The Topeka bit has made some impact on pop culture somehow, but most of the rest of it is just Mac and Pluregard Quentin Kazoo out yelling each other and going on a treasure quest where they dig so many holes that it ends with Madame Foster finding the treasure in one of the holes that they already dug out. Cheese a go go is annoyance after annoyance, nonsense plot beat after nonsense plot beat. Nothing's really achieved in all this irritation other than Blue starting a cheesy network event. This episode's gotta go, alright? Gotta go near the bottom of the list. Go 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 is their insane introduction to Goo, where she spends a long, long time ruining Mac's life because she seems to have a thing for him. This is never brought up again, and was probably the only way they could give her something to make you feel bad for her. Mac also talks about how great his friend is, his friend that makes him fall out of a tree at the start of the episode. I'm fine with them adding more emotion, but not to a zany, mindless gag fest. Goodbye to Blue is a really botched finale. Thank you for leaving me with this impression of your show, a deuteragonist who's run out of creative possibilities, jokes that test your time and patience, and a story that could have been prevented with a single sentence worth of an exchange. You're welcome, I guess? Bye Bye Nerdy is a really surface level exploration of school life and popularity. Keep in mind, Blue's never been to school and has no idea that Mac hasn't turned into an overnight nerd, but all his biases are proven correct for the rest of the shallow cast to make sense. I can't be shocked they didn't do many school episodes after this, it just had no style. The Bride to Beat has an anxiety inducing name but a genuinely good premise. Blue thinks Mac is outgrowing him, so tries too hard to behave like a grown up. Those bits are fun, but everything else is in shambles. This is another misunderstanding that could be easily avoided if Mac had just told Blue why he's being associated with marriage now. He's going to be the ring bearer at a wedding that his family isn't even attending. And I'm not forgetting about the teardrop imaginary friend who lost a kid and loves jumping off Fosters to get rid of the pain. Or the joke they do with him leading Blue to the ledge. Lauren, I love your work, but what were you thinking here? Everyone Knows It's Bendy is an especially infamous example of Foster's Home at its worst. A new imaginary friend is introduced whose kid used to blame everything on. But as it turns out, Bendy actually does trash the place and get away with murder. Everyone knows it's him except for Harriman and Frankie, and they're unable to believe they're old friends because the plot demands it. This is the episode that seemingly killed the short-lived two-segment format. The staff has admitted that they couldn't fit in a planned conclusion where Bendy's rightfully punished. Somewhere along the production line, it was just stuffed into a shorter slot and couldn't be finished, which is another thing that makes me second guess whether Cartoon Network really had its best intentions with this show. The Big Cheese is hopeless. Cheese annoys the other friends to no end on the day of an important news bulletin. Meanwhile, a new security system is put in place, but since Mr. Harriman is dumb today, he puts in a random code, but doesn't know that means remember it, so they're all stuck outside, frustrated, forced to watch Cheese and Goo do some sort of dance that'll make Cheese remember the passcode, a dance that'll greet you at the gates of hell. Then the news comes, they all look dirty and miserable, but Frankie is able to turn it around in her favour by advertising Fosters through it. I don't care if she's got a little Mickey Mouse pee in her ear feeding her lines, this doesn't make any sense. The news would prioritise how miserable the imaginary friends look, and the speech would not convince kids or parents that Foster's is right for theirs. It's like putting a wet plaster on the site of a nuke. Foster's goes to Europe is the one where they don't go to Europe. Everything that could go wrong in preparing for a trip goes wrong, to the point that it's unsurprising. If they haven't got things sorted by the end of the first act, what chance do they have implying to me they could ever get to the airport? As a matter of fact, I'd rather this just be them messing about an airport. We've had so many stories of everyone being loons at Foster's that the only way this one can stick out 
is by throwing in a European girl whom the world hates, and an ending where Madame just steals the tickets and runs. Perfect ending, honestly, a load of bull that invalidates any sort of attachment you could have had to where the story could have gone. But the episode I consider the worst is I Only Have Surprise For You. Matt gets a hunch that Blue's gonna throw him a surprise party, but since he's had such a string of terrible experiences with them, of course he's concerned. But then the lengths they go to show how crazy and paranoid he's getting are way out of proportion. The only reason to get him this worked up is if he has like 40 years of psychological baggage. But it turns out his suspicions are true, surprise surprise. After seeming to ruin a little friend's birthday party, he's forced to make it up to them by being a clown, which is then revealed to all be part of an elaborate surprise party for him, and all his so-called friends laugh at his expense. Youch. Never mind that Blue somehow got the entire home to double-cross his friend just to play an elaborate prank they know he hates, but I can't look at this as a zany gag fest or a more emotional character piece. It occupies this terrible dead zone where you won't be satisfied with it no matter what angle you watch it from. I Only Have Surprise For You is one of the very, very worst episodes of any cartoon I've seen so far, and I am very excited to see what a defense for it would look like. If you can't get enough of this one, you don't have to feel bad at all. We all like different things and we all hate different things, and there's plenty more episodes I could have picked for scrutiny. I hope I've given you a good idea of what I really didn't care for with Foster's Home, but admittedly, there were a couple good episodes that tickled my fancy. There's a couple more I'm willing to say are entertaining, but I'll just highlight six here. Say It Isn't So was able to win me over because it's something you can relate to. Madam gets distracted by a craft store while taking Blue to a theme park. The more mundane jokes are spot on, and you're able to sympathize with Blue and want to see him escape to the park. That alone is an accomplishment by this point. The sweet stench of success sees Blue fake his way into a news report and somehow become a mascot for a brand of deodorant. His agent turns out to be incredibly abusive though, so I'd say he gets more than enough punishment for his fib at the start. Plus, the DOTV special is far more elaborate than it had any right to be. Blue involves Blue getting a cold and being mistaken for a ghost by his roommates. The dynamic is pretty fun here, probably among their best team-ups. Walt and Eduardo aren't too exaggerated yet, and Coco gets to be the first female Ghostbuster. I like the colour palette they employ for this one too. It makes the extra artistic flourishes, like this weirdly long staircase that never shows up again, all the more memorable. Good Wilt Hunting was a good movie that delved into Wilt's backstory and why he's so obsessed with helping and apologizing. You see him reunite with his kid, Jordan Michaels, who tells him he no longer needs to apologize for everything. He subsequently does it even more later on, am I meant to watch this show backwards? They also reveal where Eduardo and Coco come from, and they're somewhat wholesome and Loco and the Coco respectively. The Big Lablewski is a bowling episode, already they got something right. But the bowling imaginary friend who dispenses wisdom to Mac is a gem. Absolutely makes the episode for me. It's neat too how they get most of the cast involved in their own way in some manner or another, as well as introducing everyone's favorite part of the show, Madam's Circle of Friends. If there's one episode I can safely say is great and worth many rewatches, it's this one. But it's not my number one pick because that belongs to another TV movie, Destination Imagination. A mysterious locked toy box turns up at the front door one day, and Frankie, fed up with Harriman's careless treatment of her, decides to open it and finds a magical toy world run by a single living entity. Mac and the gang journey through it to rescue her, sorely missing her help, and get roped into a very bizarre adventure. Lifeless towns, piano bridges, sugar druggings, and a deranged king who's got serious abandonment issues. It's thrilling, colourful, and touching too. But I can't help but feel sad that this is the only time Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends will ever be able to be this groundbreaking and truly imaginative. If it wasn't for the fatal production era where the gang travel through a video game resembling the underground levels in Super Mario Bros. and Will picks up and throws a Koopa shell which was a move not introduced until the third game, I dare to call it good. I like more than six episodes, I really do, but I also dislike way more than 15. If I had to find a positive spin on this assessment, it's that Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends is a very spiky and dramatic show that tends to get a lot out of the audience. It gives you a very promising world to play in, 
but you have to follow its rules if you want to have a good time. Those rules tend to be arbitrary and can change on a whim, but it still has a peculiar sense of humour about it that could keep you on board. Unfortunately, it's not a sense of humour I feel was appropriate for the direction they initially started out with. It got warped along the way and it's painfully obvious. A lot of the problems with the way Foster's Home was handled are thankfully problems only applicable to 90s and 2000s cartoons. Studios are far more willing to let creators tell the stories they want now, and it's led to Craig and Lauren making shows that were far better fleshed out and acclaimed by audiences they never expected. Some meddling still occurred, but not at the cost of the cause of these shows before they even premiered. If Foster's Home were made today, and there are rumblings of a reboot, I'm sure Cartoon Network would be more than willing and even encouraging of those initial plans. I'm serious, I think the live action reimagining could be a step above the original in terms of character development. If the crew are still ultimately proud of their work, they don't need to apologize to me. Seeking their attention isn't the point of this review. As long as they still have fans that have loved the show for nearly 20 years now, then they should feel good about it, as should the fans. There are still a couple episodes I'd recommend giving a whirl, and all the TV movies are worth your time too. But hopefully I've convinced you why I'm not a fan of the original series, and which episodes to look out for, because your opinion still matters the most to you. You might find something here that captures your imagination. Goodbye for now, and thanks for listening. I'm just totally improvising watch. Watch, can you turn it up? Go back. I'm just brilliant.